<laughs> yeah, well, it's wonderful to, to hear all that. It's, it's, I mean, I honestly think that Philadelphia has some of the most exciting organizing going on anywhere. Um, and it's so... <laughs> and, and it's just that difficult work of those... Um, of those, those, those unexpected um, partnerships, those difficult conversations, and as, as you said, you know, trying for the third time, right? I mean, there's something to me so inspiring about that because this is not easy work, and it isn't easy um, because there's difficult history and it is, and 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 conflicting interests in lots of ways, and and. Um, and it's just always easier to walk away from the table um, than to come back to it and try again. Um, and so the fact that this is happening and that there are all these different tables in the city where people are trying to actually solve and work through this um, and learn from, from mistakes and make new mistakes is, is, is really exciting and, and not something that is happening everywhere, right? So I think that Philadelphia really does have an opportunity to lead by example. I don't love when, it, when people talk about the U.S. leading by example um, because I think it's a bit late for that. Um, <laughs> you know, I think the U.S. when it comes to climate needs to lead by like putting some serious cold hard cash on the table um, and cutting back the military. Um, <laughs> just for migrants, things like that. So I don't think there's any sort of shining city on the hill for the U.S. As a nation, but I do think that a city like Philadelphia um, has so much to teach, uh, um, and in part maybe because it has been out of the spotlight um, and the focus, and people have had to organize in new and creative ways. But the fact is, um, we do need all levels of government to get things done on the kind of deadline that we're talking about. But so many of, what, of, of, of what we think of as um, a, a, a transformational climate policy actually plays out at the local level, right? Where we get our energy, how we live in cities, you know, if we're going to live densely, if we are going to, how we move ourselves around, these core transit questions, you know, whether we're going to have green gentrification or whether we're actually going to figure out how to live together, right? Um, and I think cities model this. Because the truth is that the space where it is possible for humans to live on this planet is contracted. So we're all going to have to figure out how to share. Um, or else we're just going to hoard and build fortresses. And that's, you know, that is something else that we're seeing. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to be staying tuned because, you know, also when, you know, when I look around the world, I, I think cities are already leading in really exciting ways, whether it's, you know, Barcelona and the Atacalao and the, sort of the, the, the super blocks and, and taking back parts of the city from cars or some of what's been happening in, you know, in other European cities with actually having green affordable housing and in the downtown core and not pushing people out of cities um, or free transit. I mean, these are core climate solutions. And cities can't do it on their own, but I think cities can really develop the agenda and develop the constituency that is demanding it, right? Because this is, I think, part of the biggest problem we've had when it comes to people imagining that we could rise to this crisis is that people have associated climate action with this sort of free market so-called solutions that have just made life more expensive for people for a long time, right? There's a reason why people think of green issues as something that you care about if you don't have anything better to care about, right? Um, because in pretty consistently, green policies have been, a, you know, increased people's cost of living, people's electricity costs, people's transit costs, and that's what kicked things off in, in, in Chile, right? Um, you know, they electrified the bus system and then increased fares, right? Um, and it's not that people don't want green transit, it's that they're not going to pay the bill for a crisis that they didn't create. And so I think that. <laughs> but one thing I would just offer, maybe uh, as, 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 as my final contribution, and I don't know if it might be useful, this is something I talk um, Todd Wilson um, was going to be here tonight and sadly um, uh, wasn't able to be here because he, he threw his back out. But 
know, Todd has done great organizing around the gig economy. And one of the things that Todd and I talk about is like that our current economy is like a gig and gig economy, right? Um, that is all about maximal extraction from people and planet, um, and then just throwing both away. Um, as if there is no limit, as if there is no consequence for the destruction of people's lives and of the natural systems on which all of life depends, right? It's that ultimate short-term thinking at the heart of both the gig economy and the gig economy. Um, and so in thinking together with lots of other people about like what, what embodies this, the, the next economy, um, I love the phrase that we are moving from this gig and gig economy to um, an economy based on care and repair. Um, and the care piece we've talked about, the, the care work being low carbon work, overwhelmingly women's work, overwhelmingly immigrant women's work, which is systematically devalued um, because it is immigrant women's work. Um, and what if those were well-paying jobs? What if we actually value the work of care? Um, but thinking about repair, I think, is a really generative idea because there's a lot of repair that we have to do, and it also creates work. Like repairing what we have done to the earth, that's a pretty big clean job, you know? So it isn't just making new stuff, it's also just cleaning up the mess um, that has been left behind that we need to do, and also, um, Know, the kind of reforestation and rewilding and habitat restoration that needs to happen because climate isn't the only crisis we face. We also face an extinction crisis. Um, and, and we also need to learn to repair our stuff so that we don't just like consume and throw away, which is the heart of this crisis. As much as we try to change the subject to just buy a new green thing, we actually just can't just have the disposable culture that we have. But then obviously the third repair is, 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 is the repair that you've all been talking about, which is repairing our relationships um, and dating back to, to the founding of our country. Um, and I don't think we move forward without that repair. So um, I, I really do think that that, that that reparation work, that sort of triple restoration, and I'm sure there's lots of restorations that I have, um, reparations that I have, that re restorations and reparations that I haven't, even mentioned, um, but I feel like that maybe could be a helpful framing for, for some glue that can keep us at the table <laughs> doing this really, really difficult work when, when, it's, it, when we want to run away because it's hard. So, thanks.